So good morning. Great to be together. Uh, thank you for coming out and visiting us. If you're visiting, thank you for coming out if you are supposed to be here. And uh, great to see everybody online. We have a group of guys, so you may see there's a big portion of our congregation not here. And also last night, we had a service last night, and there were some guys that aren't here. They're all getting certified with scuba diving. Okay. So they're watching online, um, which is exciting, which is great, if they survived. If they survived. I started to send little, little memes to them of like sharks yeah. attacking them and stuff like that. Like you're skipping church and this is what's going to happen to you. Know, I thought it was funny, but it's not funny, huh? Yeah, sorry. I didn't get great reactions. I thought I was going to get like really great reactions from them, but I didn't, I didn't get good reactions. Anyway, so I have a public service announcement that I want to make. Okay. Okay. I am a sinner. Yes. Okay. So if you didn't know that, or if you thought I was someone else, I just want to make sure that you know that I am a sinner in need of a Savior just like you. Now, if you didn't know that you were a sinner, this is for you too. Okay, so we're, we're a group of sinners in need of a Savior. Uh, I was talking to a brother yesterday, and I started thinking, we were both thinking about what we don't deserve. And I started thinking about my wife. And how I don't deserve a wife. Especially Dina. Like on top of category wife, quote unquote wife, uh, God blessed me with an amazing, incredible woman that there's no way that I could lead without God. God gave me children. Not just any children, but two incredible daughters that there's no way that I could lead them or oversee them without God. And then I started to think, any victory, success, anything that's good in my life, God gave me. Anything. You can name anything right now and put it down on a list. Well, Matt, here's some of the things that you have, or here's some of the things that you've achieved, or this is what, and all from God. Everything's from God. The only reason I have any of it is, is just because I continue to get better at surrender. And then God wows me with something. So, you know, I loved what Ryan said this morning. We're a group of broken people, you know, and if you came here to be a part of, like, brokenness, and as we venture and adventure, you know, into this journey with God, it is, it's mind-blowing. Like, all of us could probably stand up and tell you a story about how God salvaged us and how everything we have is just from God. So, yeah, um, that's us. So from one center to another, that's what this whole sermon is going to be about because we're all sinners. We're, we've come together, and we're going to try to find some golden nuggets that God may have in store for us this morning. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So let's go ahead, and we're going to say a prayer, and then uh, I've got a lesson for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, good morning. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, we, uh, we've just chosen to, t to carve out a couple hours out of our life. Uh, that includes travel. Uh, to come here and to spend time together uh, in your presence, God. I pray that as we uh, look at your word, as we hear a message, uh, that me personally, I will be out of the way. Uh, my insecurities, fears, whatever it might be, uh, God, I pray that you will remove me from the equation and that you will speak to our hearts this morning. I pray for the hearts uh, in this room, including my own, that uh, really in the end, um, after we've gone through and seen what you have want us to see, uh, that we'll be brought closer to you and that we'll make decisions, uh, we'll repent of something, that we'll find something uh, that will help us to be more like your son. We love you, we thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you ready? Like, are you fist pump ready? Ready for what, right? Yeah, ready for what? Are you ready right now? Are you ready? Are you at attention? Are you ready for what's next? Yeah, I don't know. Are you ready for Jesus to come back right this second? Woo! Like, are you ready right now? Oh, yeah. do, do you have a clear conscience? Do you feel great about your relationship with God? Do you feel that you are 
right next to Jesus? Are you ready for him to return right this second? <laughs> or are you saying, let's put a pin in that? Yeah. Let's talk about that later. Let's schedule Jesus' return. That way I can get ready for it. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had like an expiration date on our birth certificate? Like we knew when it was going to happen. So we could live and we can just be crazy and wild. And then we know that as long as we get everything straightened before that end, then we're good. But we don't get that. You know, we don't know when the end's going to come. All we know is that it's going to come eventually. And in, in the way that the, the Bible describes it, it's going to be like a thief in the night. We're not going to know when. And I love how it's described. And if you knew when the thief was going to come, then you would be ready for the thief. But that's not how it's going to happen. So am I ready? Am I ready to meet my maker? Ready for Jesus to return? Will I feel confident on that day? Come on. That day. 1 John 2.28 talks about being confident and unashamed before God unashamed at his coming. You know, I think a lot of times I think about the shame, you know, the, the mistakes just from this morning that I'm embarrassed about. That, oh, don't look at me. Ah, you know, don't, don't see me, you know. Confident that one day we'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Are we confident that those hands will go onto our shoulders and those eyes, those celestial eyes, I don't know what those eyes are going to look like, but they're going to probably be pretty awesome. We'll look into our eyes and say, well done. I'm so proud of you. Amen. So there's something that, that when I stay on top the sub, the, of this subject, I do feel that confident. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you, if you want to have a title, if you want a title to this sermon, it's called Deal With Your Junk. Yeah. Okay? Who does it sound like? Omar. Omar. Okay. Are you saying he's a junkie? Nope. Okay. He's not here, so you can talk about him. All right. But when I have this kind of in place. When I'm working on this, it seems like the rest of my life just kind of falls into place. So when I'm concentrating on this, the rest of, rest of everything else just kind of takes care of itself. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 7 says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. And we're going we're gonna to flesh this out a little bit. The older version of the NIV is what I have in my mind, okay? The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Okay, so then I thought, wow, big difference. And then, of course, you go to Bible Gateway, right? And you start looking at all the different versions of the same verse, and you're going, let's go Greek. Okay. All right, so eventually you got to go, okay, we got to go way back, back in the time, and go Greek, and kind of see, you know, what, what is Peter trying to get across to us? Well, the Greek, the, the phrase there is, is like sane and sober. Okay, so to be sane and sober. But what does that mean? Well, sane, rational, stable, sound, real. Be real. Don't be trying to be like somebody else. Be real. And I know we've said it before, but it's kind of like I'm going to be myself as I become more like Jesus. As opposed to pretending to be someone else, okay, and being a hypocrite with a mask, right? Okay, so sane, rational, stable, sound, real. And sober, well, really the context here is clear-headed, but also clean. You know how like people say, you need to get clean, right? You got to get clean. You got to get off the junk. Get clean. So that's really what this scripture is saying. It's like, look, sane and sober, Rational sobriety. So what are the things that stop us from getting to God? What hinders us from being close to him? What hinders us to be, from being clean? What stops me from feeling confident and secure like I described earlier? Well done, good and faithful servant. What stops me from loving my spouse, my children, you guys? 
my neighbors, God? What stops me from having a clear relationship, a clean relationship? Well, it's all pointing to one thing, and really what this kind of describes is our conscience. Now, I'm not talking about a seared conscience, worldliness, live it up. If it doesn't hurt anybody, then I'm not hurting. You know, I'm talking about a spiritual comp, uh, confidence before God, a clear conscience. Okay, we're going we're gonna to kind of flesh this out. All right. Really, what I've kind of come to and what, when I look in the mirror is really dealing with what I need to deal with, being real, free, honest, rational, clear, and clean. So now I kind of look, well, we've been talking about the Spirit of God, living within the Scriptures, listening to that nagging from the Spirit, that nudging from the Spirit, and doing what I know is right. That gives me a clear conscience. So when he communicates to us that we need to deal or say something, do something, help a person, reach out to a person. Do something. How many times have we felt that nudge and we've said no? And what happens to our conscience? It gets seared. Our heart becomes hard. We know that we should do it, but we pass it up. We know that we should say something and we don't. We stay silent. So what's stopping me? We're going to call these conscience hindrance is. <laughs> it's a real new word. Okay, new vocabulary word. When I typed it in, it was underlined red. <laughs> but when I put it all in bold and ital- in, in kind of uh, in all capitals, then the red went away. So now I can call it a word. <laughs> conscience hindrances. All right, things that get in the way of having a clear conscience. So what are we not dealing with? So here's here's what Peter's saying to us. You ready for this? The end is near, so deal and get clean. Okay? The end is near, so deal and get clean. When? Now. Now. Okay? Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. Like, we're Americans. We like plans. We really do. And we like to even plan our spiritual walk. You ever notice that? Hey, when I go overcome this and when I deal with this or when I get the certain job or when I'm able to, when my kids get a little older, you know, if I didn't have this, if I, when I have that or when we move or when we, we always have like these things scheduled. Then we'll start praying together. Then I will start leading my household. Then we'll start having family devotionals. And then we'll, you know, if I, when this happens, then that, you know, and we just have all of these if thens. Really, the answer is, right now. The Bible's in real time. And when we know the good we ought to do and we don't do it, that's sin for us. So once these scriptures are delivered to us and the Spirit of God is talking to us, it's now. Right now. Okay? So when's the time that we should deal with these things? Amen. Some of us got it. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. Or just turn on your Bible and type it in. Yeah. All right. Let's go to Acts. All right, five, and we're going to be in verse one. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then 
Some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out to be buried. About three hours later, his wife came in. Not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you, Ananias, got for the land? Yes, she said. That is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. That's right. Makes us all want to have that reaction. You know, this story's not meant to scare us. Surely it is. It's meant to show us what can happen if we don't deal. How quickly we can get ourselves into a mess if we don't deal with our junk. Ananias and Sapphira, right? First, Ananias gets greedy, right? Ananias gets greedy. Anybody in this room ever deal with greed? There was a time in our movement... I love confessing the sin of our past, you know, so we can never repeat it. Yeah. We used to put so much pressure on special contribution. I love the way that we do special contribution. Three times a year, $100 a person. If you want to give more, great. If you don't, that's between you and God. And we're good with it. And we've given more than we ever have in our church history. Yeah. Amen. Back in the day, though, we used to take our regular contribution. So say that you give $100 a month or, uh, I'm sorry, $100 a week in your regular contribution, Right. Then we would go, and we're going to give 15 times that. The whole church, and we would put a goal out there, and there was so much pressure on the family group leaders and the zone leaders and the region leaders and all the different leaders to make sure that that happened. And if we didn't, it was this big failure. It was almost like, pass the plate again. What didn't you sell? And I mean, people are selling, women are selling their wedding rings. I mean, it was like so much pressure. So, listen, you don't think that's, tempting like being in that situation feeling like that's what was kind of going on here people were selling all of their land and laying it all at the apostles feet and there was a lot of peer pressure so you don't think that this guy Ananias was going listen we're gonna apply a little wisdom to this right I'll give some it's better than none like Joe over here so at least I'm not as bad as Joe if, if your name's Joe sorry Joey I'll just use the word Sam. Sam. No, sorry, Sam. John. Okay, anyway. Jack. So Ananias gets greedy. Greed really a lot of times comes from fear. You know, you get a little scared that you may not have enough. I mean, it, it, we all fall into that stuff. And he probably thinks that he's doing a pretty big thing by selling this piece of land and giving some of it. So where did he actually go wrong? It wasn't that he didn't give everything. And he, it's even said there, it's like, we know, you know what I mean? We know that you, you got it. What are you doing here? But that he lied and pretended that he did. He pretended and he wanted everyone to think that he did. That's why he was asked the question. Now, if he, listen, if he, didn't, he wasn't pretending that he was giving all of it, and he said, hey, I'm just going to give a small percentage of what the proceeds were, then we wouldn't even be reading the story. Yeah. Sapphira's problem, it's twofold. All right, first, she lets her husband get away with the lie. She conspires full knowledge. Man, I mean, the Bible just does not cut any corners, no short. I mean, it was like with the full knowledge of what her husband did, full knowledge of the lie. And she's asked the same question. Oh. And what does it do to her conscience when she lets her husband get away with this? And we can think all the way back to the beginning of mankind, first sin. Very similar, right? Husband just stands around. Adam's like, all right, we'll see what happens. What should he have done? He should have slapped that fruit out of her hand. They should have grabbed the broom and swept the serpent right out of the garden and said, hey, I'm free. I'm clean. I'm wearing my birthday suit. 
right? Confident, secure. From that time on, oh, don't look at me. Ah, darkness. So it's nothing new. Then she lies to the apostles instead of just being honest. They ask her directly, is it? Is this true? And she really could have gone, ah, no, it's not. We need counseling. <laughs> we need counseling. I don't know what to tell you. We just were giving into fear or whatever. She didn't know her husband was dead yet. She should have said, hey, my, my, my husband crossed the line. But she didn't say anything. Here's what's scary. How many of us live this way every day? Our spouse says something, does something, we don't say anything. We let them get away with it. We don't do anything. We don't challenge them. We don't call them to righteousness. And then what happens? Our conscience gets seared. Our conscience gets seared. Our kids act out. They say something. We ignore it. They'll grow out of it. That was my grandfather saying. They'll grow out of it. Leave them alone. They'll grow out of it. Really, that's just a way of ignoring it. Don't deal with it. Who wants to deal with that? You know, and, and it messes with our conscience. It messes us up. A roommate, a coworker, classmate, brother, sister in church, acting out, doing something you know is wrong, and you know that you should say something, stand in, stand up for somebody, or whatever it might be. We don't do it, and it sears our conscience. We know we should say something. We know that we, do some, we should do something. How often do we do it? And I'll ask you right now, how much has piled up? Looking back, how much junk do we really have? So when should we deal with this? Today's the day, right? Today's the day. Tomorrow's too late. Because what happens is we allow ourselves to corrupt our conscience. And we, a lot of us know the concept, we build a wall between us and God. We start laying these bricks, this foundation between God and us. We're not feeling anymore. We're not chasing God. We're not seeking God because we've got this stuff in between us. A little white lie or a big red lie. Impurity, lust, cursing, slander, hate or jealousy, greed, envy, drinking, smoking, you know, attitudes and judgmentalism. Boy, that, that could just creep into the church. Why are they doing it that way? Why are they three singers today? Ryan, you know, can you tell us why there's three? Why aren't there five? You know, it, I don't like it this way. And why are we sitting? Why did we move the chairs again? Well, here we go. Moving the chairs again. Nobody knows where to sit. <laughs> ACs, it's too cold in here. Too hot in here. You got people running up there, turning it down, turning it back up, turning it down. I finally stopped locking them. Because someone actually took the key off the key ring. Y'all need to fess up. I don't know who it is. I'm serious, too. That key is gone. So whoever has it, you let me know. Crazy. Today's the day. Better be back in there. No. But we'll live with attitudes towards one another. We're shaking our heads and I can't believe they would do something like that. Or living with a bad habit that we know is wrong. is tearing us down, tearing everybody down around us. Robbing, of our, robbing us of our clear conscience. We think we're getting away with something. We are not. We got to confess, get clean, deal with our junk. Don't be a junkie. Don't live on the junk. Don't live on it. It's going to tear you up. It's going to destroy your life, and it's going to destroy those around us. Where do you think these concepts come from? Look at Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Amen. Not wrath. See, we think we confess and renounce, you'll find wrath, embarrassment, shame. No, we find mercy, grace, love, Amen. respect. I respect a man who's man enough to stand up and say what he did. I will follow that guy Amen. right onto the battlefield. I will. But someone who's afraid because they've got this amazing, polished outer shell? I don't trust that guy. He won't have my back, or maybe he will, but I'm not sure. The light revealing ourselves is where the healing is at. That's where the healing is at. 
Not confessing, being open, causes us to be sick and injured. That's what the Bible teaches. And we don't find mercy and grace and healing. If you're not finding mercy and grace, probably not being open. Because it's humbling and you feel that grace wash over you like a wave. You feel this little, right? And you confess the sin, you feel like one inch tall. And then you realize, I'm not on the hook for this. I'm forgiven, and that just washes over you like a wave. And all of a sudden, you go, that's what grace is about. I forgot. Yeah. I forgot. We all forget. And we're reminded by our shortcomings. So we got to sober up. Sober up. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's not what the world teaches, guys. That's what the Bible teaches. So we've got to go by what the Bible teaches, not what the world teaches. It's upside down. It's a dichotomy. Living a Christian life is a dichotomy. So we've got to get that stuff out. We've got to deal. And a lot of us don't feel clean and confident because we're living in darkness. We're junkies. We're living with our junk. Okay? So we may have to knock down the wall of sin all over again. You know, it's okay. It's not a one-time thing. Yeah. I think I'm realizing that more and more as I'm older as a Christian, mm -hmm. that the wall of sin is a continual process of knocking down. Mm -hmm. I've got to knock it down all the time. I've got to crucify myself all the time. I've got to kill old Matt. He always wants to resurrect, right? And get his, stick his head up, and he wants to take over and take over my life and take over everybody's life around. Hey, ask someone who's been addicted to drugs that, that doesn't feel that way sometimes. I smoked for a couple of years. I'm 27 years as a Christian. I haven't touched a cigarette in 27 years or so, right? I get done eating. To this day, I feel like sometimes, it's not all the time, but sometimes I feel like something's missing. And I'm going, oh, it's nicotine. I know it. I was addicted to it, and I'm still addicted to it. I know that it's there. Once a junkie, always a junkie. I can go back to my sin any minute. Any minute, I'm right back to where I was. So every day I've got to die. Every day I've got to make a decision to be different. Every day I've got to decide that Jesus is Lord. It's not a one-time thing. So why would I be surprised that I might end up with a little bit of a wall in between God and I that I've got to knock down again? Yeah. It's not a one-time thing. So don't be surprised that you need rehab. And we, as a church, we're going through rehab, recovery. And we're at spiritual recovery. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. It's an opportunity to get the junk out of our life. Because God loves us. He wants us to be free. And he wants us to be able to worship him with a clear heart and a clear conscience. Amen. Amen. Yep. Okay. We'll go up to the next. So first, we've got to deal with our junk. Well, unfortunately, we've got other people's junk. Right? Sometimes we feel like a garbage man. Right? Like, now i got to take out the trash again. This is not even my trash. You ever feel overwhelmed by other people's junk? Some of us are fine. I'm fine with being open with my own junk. But it's kind of tough when we call other people to deal with their junk. It is. That's when it gets tough. It gets uncomfortable, right? Confronting others with their junk. We see something. We see some junk. We smell, we smell something with their garbage can. Right? And we go, man, that's a full garbage can. Something stinks. And we got to deal with that junk. It's hard to approach others. Something, someone else's mess. But see, someone else's mess, knowing that they have junk, will mess up our conscience as well. That was Sapphira, right? She had the same problem. She didn't deal with her husband in the beginning, and it led to her lying to the apostles and ultimately meeting her own doom. Right? So if she had to deal with her husband's junk. Maybe that wasn't even her junk to begin with, but it ended up being her junk, and it took her down. So we've got to deal with each other as well as ourselves. Warn each other, correct each other, rebuke each other, train each other. That's what the Bible teaches us to do. If we know somebody's getting themselves into trouble, we've got to speak up. Look at some of these scriptures. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin... You who live by the Spirit, look around. That's us. We live by the Spirit. That's not like ultimate, you know, the ultimate guy at the top of the chain. No, this is those of us who have the Spirit of God. Live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. See, restore that person. But watch, watch yourselves 
or you also may be tempted, carry each other's burdens. We're called to carry each other's burdens, carry each other's junk. Help each other do that. Right? Hey, I'll help you. You ever watch the garbage men come onto your street? I don't know. That's what I do sometimes. So the garbage men come onto my street, but but some of our neighbors, they, they put these big, huge Chester drawers and armoires and things like that onto the street. And this poor one guy that's on the back of the garbage truck hops out and is kind of like staging the thing. And then what happens? Well, eventually the, the driver jumps out and helps him, right? And helps him to throw the big, part, big piece of junk into the garbage truck and they move on. That's going to happen with us too. Like sometimes you may go to help somebody with their junk, but it's, it's really hard and it's heavy. So we may have to call in another person to help with the junk. Amen. Okay. So it's just a way that you deal with junk. It is what it is. It's junk. All right. Carry each other's burdens. They're junk. And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. That makes Jesus happy. It makes God happy with us. Matthew 18, we're going to look at Matthew 18 in a, in, in, again in a minute. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. That's being judgmental. No, we've got to point out the fault. That's the first step. Hey, I see something in you that's not like the Bible. I see that you're living in sin. I see that this is going to produce something bad in your life. We've got to point out the fault just between the two of you. I'm not going to do it from the pulpit. You're not going to do it in the middle of your family group. Ah, just like I said, Ralph over here, he's the one who always is late. You know, hey, Ralph, stand up. You're late. You know, we don't do that. Just between the two of us with respect, honor, grace, love, mercy. Amen. Just the two of you in private. And then we don't go off telling everybody about it. You should have seen Ralph. I had a talk with him. The guy's still late. Ralph. We don't have a Ralph in the congregation, so... Look at this. Warn. Warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. We're supposed to be warning one another. Look out. Watch out. Not condemn. See, warn. I think we think warning as a condemn condemnation. You're a bad person. You're a gross. You're a horrible. Look what you're doing to the church. You're, you're out. We throw that brother out of the church. No, it's warn. Hey, look, you're going down a bad road. It's causing problems in your family group, in your family, with your kids, I'm warning you, you continue to go down this road, you're going to be losing everything, dude. You, you got to heed this warning. We're supposed to be doing that for one another, warning each other. Danger, danger. It's not personal. We're just obeying the scriptures. So, Ephesians 4.15 calls us to speak the truth in love. Galatians 2, Paul writes, this is awesome, Paul writes, about confronting Cephas, Peter. But what was Peter doing? He was living a two-faced life. He was pretending to be one way with the Gentiles and another way with the Jews. And he warned him, hey, you can't live this way. It's going to rip the kingdom up. Just trust God. Trust God. He's going to take care of it. It's going to be okay. He warns him. Nathan stands up to David, delivers him the truth. That probably was easy. David was in a great place spiritually, right? Sometimes we're afraid because they're not in a good place. Well, I'll talk to him at another time. No, that's the time you got to talk to him. Look what Nathan did. Nathan went to David at the most dangerous time. David was trying to hide it. Just got done killing somebody to hide it. And that's when Nathan goes, we got to have a talk. Because the spirit nudged him and said, hey, you got to have a talk with David. And he listened. prophets of the Old Testament, Jesus himself. So if I know that I can get involved, but I don't, I find myself with a dirty conscience, with a seared conscience. It prevents me to be, from being close to you guys and eventually separates me from God. If I continue to live that way. So I've got to speak up, got to help out, got to get involved, amen. And it's not comfortable and it's not easy, but it will clear our conscience and give us the confidence that we need before God and we can pray. Look at that. Isn't that wild? Ezekiel 33. If the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin. Okay, they're going to get what they deserve. Amen, God will not be mocked, but I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. 
Oh, no, you're not off the hook. You knew something was going on in that person's life, and you didn't say anything? You knew that it was going in down that direction, and you didn't speak up? You didn't warn them? I think all of us fall into that category, and all of us are like, oh. But here's why we don't do it. Sometimes it doesn't go the way we planned, right? We go to help somebody with their junk, and it pulls us right into their junk, and we fall right into the dumpster along with them. And it doesn't go the way. See, we, we planned that we would speak up. They would go, oh, thank you, brother, for speaking up and helping me. And thank you, bro, for being so grateful for that help that I pointed out in your life. And now we can be embrace one another, and it's bunnies and kittens, and it's off. And we just skip together holding hands into the, you know. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way a lot of times, right? You speak up, and what happens? You know, it's a big car wreck. Who, are, who do you think you are telling me about that? You, you have this going on in your life. So why are you coming to me about mine? You better take the plank out of your own eye before you start talking about the dust in mine. And, you know, and then we even have those conversations. That may not even be what happens, but we're afraid that will happen, so we hesitate. And we stop. So it doesn't go the way that we're planned. Turn your Bibles over to Matthew 18. Let's go. Come on, Matthew. Come on, Matthew. All right, we're going to look at a, a passage of Scripture that has been taken out of context more times than I can count. But we're going to use it properly this morning. Amen. No context. Matthew 18, verse 15. It's become known as the Matthew 18 principle. Uh, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won, won them over. Amen. That's, that's utopia. But, uh-oh, but if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Okay. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind... Here, bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven again. Truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where there are two or three gathered in my name, there am I with them. Hmm, okay, so what is this really about? It's about kicking people out of the church, right? Yep, bring, bring, you talk to them, they don't listen to you. Take somebody along with you, they don't listen to them. Take the whole church with you, now they're still not listening. What do you do with that guy? Kick him out. No, what, 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 what do we end up with? What, what is, what's the aim of Jesus here? Unity. Unity, that's the aim. He goes, look, guys, if you're unified, I'm with you. You guys come, two or three of you guys come together in unity. In my name, man, you ask for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. Anything, what do you guys want? So the, the aim of this is unity, not throw the brother out. <laughs> it, it's not exorcism for the church. We've treated it that way. Get the evil out of the church. No, it's not. That's not what Jesus is aiming at. Jesus is aiming at let's salvage someone. Let's help someone. It's going to take a little bit more intention, time, effort. Out of context, this is a very dangerous dangerous scripture. So it's about reconciliation, not judgment. So the goal is to leave these conversations more united, not get our pound of flesh. This is what you did. You deserve X, Y, and Z. No. Because it goes on. Context is king, right? Yep. Look at verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? That's the law. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Dun, dun, dun. Therefore, the kingdom of God is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began settle, settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, what is this from Jesus? Is it a true story? It's a parable, okay? It's a fable created to teach us a lesson, okay? Um, since he was not able to pay. So basically he says, a billion zillion dollars. You ever do that with your kids? How much does that cost? A billion zillion. 
So that's what Jesus said. A billion zillion. He owed him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. What? Wow. Verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours, a million, zillion, billion, because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Oh, man. In context, the one who was wronged has a large something large to overcome there. They have to forgive what had happened. So it's, what, doesn't that turn over on you? Matthew 18, we're going to use it to kick somebody out. Nope, Matthew 18, we're going to use it for you to be more forgiving. Boy, Jesus does that to us all the time. And how are we supposed to forgive them? From the heart. Like God forgave and if we don't do that, God's like, you're in big trouble. Big trouble. Look at Colossians chapter 3 here. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. All right. So we're going to go back to Greek for just for a second, okay? Um, look at some of these highlights, okay? The, the word bearing actually means tolerating. When you tolerate, that's ongoing, never ends. All right, I think it's a better definition of the word. You tolerate it. You bear underneath it. You go, <sighs> okay, here it comes again. Oh, it's still going on. Oh, here it happens again. Oh, it's continuing on. What if it never ends? You tolerate it. You, you're the one who changes instead of the other person. Whoa. Of one another and gracing them, pouring grace on someone, covering them with grace. You're tolerating it, but you're not having an attitude about it. Why? Because you're gracing them. You're giving them grace and mercy, and you're pouring that. It's an ongoing thing, not just a one-time thing. See, we say grace. It's over. I forgave you already. I gave you the grace. Now you took advantage of my grace, and now, nope, it's gracing. It's an ongoing approach to toleration. How is that supposed to happen? Well, I got this other one here, blame, complaint. Now, if you look at other ones, have grievance against someone, blaming someone for something. And then when I put it underneath the context of Jesus dying for me, removing the blame. Jesus does not blame you for going, for him having to go to the cross. Oh. He does not hold you accountable. You have been released from the blame. How are we supposed to deal with someone else's sin? Release them from the blame. You no longer did it. But it's ongoing. Tolerate it, grace it, and remove the blame. Oh, that's a tall order, isn't it? How are we supposed to do it? Uh, according as the anointed graces, just like Jesus did. What level? All the way. Closure. Just the way that he did with you. Do you see how it humbles us? We go before the scriptures. How can we possibly hold something against somebody? Yeah. Got to deal with your junk, other people's junk. Now, this is a quick point. My junk might be other people's junk and end up becoming my junk. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. 
because of your junk, but it became their junk. Leave your gift at the altar in front, and leave your gift at the front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Gift. What is, what is a gift in the kingdom of God? Singing, playing an instrument, leadership, teaching, hospitality, serving, uh, organizing, ministration. These are all gifts from God. Abilities that we wouldn't have unless God said, hey, I'm going to make you this way. Good at something. So if I know that someone is still upset with me, I need to stop and deal with that junk because now if I don't, we've got two junkies. Right? Two junkies. We've got one who's living in their junk and the other one is upset about the junk that that guy is living in because that junk hurt them. And it's still not dealt with, so now we got two junkies. How do you feel about a junkie coming up here and telling another, telling you guys how to live? Nope. You need to step down for a second, deal with the junk, and then come back. Now, multiply it through the church. You end up having the next episode of Scrapyard Dynasty. How much junk that we don't deal with, that we know that people have junk against us, and if it's becoming their junk, well, we've just agreed to not agree. Not allowed to do that, guys. I'm sorry. You can't agree not to agree. No, yes, you can. No, you can't. We're supposed to be perfectly united in mind and thought. That's our aim. And that takes work and intention and blood, sweat, and tears. That's why we call each other brothers and sisters. It's a special relationship, and it's spirit-led, not emotional-led. Like, when we fall into our emotions and we say, no, I don't feel like it, eh, wrong. Doesn't matter if you feel like it or not, because you're not the leader. If you call yourself a Christian, you're not the leader. You died. Different set of rules. Now you live by the Word of God. So if the Word of God calls us to do something, we don't have a choice. No, you do have a choice. But that choice will end up you being a Christian or not. How far do you want to take it? See how humbling it is? Ooh, okay, I'm not in charge. It's not my rules. It's God's rules. And if I don't live by them, I don't have to, but if I don't live by them, there's a consequence. And that doesn't come through me or you. We don't divvy out the consequence. The consequence is you refuse to obey the word of God. Then it will produce something. Now, It's not realistic that we're not going to sin against each other. It's going to happen. Yeah. So this is something that we've got to grow in. We've got to get better at. All of us. Yeah. yeah, I've dealt with that. Nope, it's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing growth. It should be the norm in our congregation that we deal with our junk, other people's junk, and the junk that we have that's affecting other people's junk. Because we don't want to end up like this. We're a scrapyard, and we've got specialists going in to find someone that might be salvageable in this church. It's a scary place to be. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 5.8 teaches us that our very ministry is based on reconciliation. What's the ministry that we've been given? The ministry of reconciliation. That should be the best thing about us is that we reconcile quick, easy, fast. We deal with it. Why? Because we're good at it. Because that's our ministry. We're helping people to get to God. We're helping each other to get to each other. It should be fully on, full on reconciliation all the time because that's our ministry. And when we do, we're enabled to apply something, okay? And just stay with me for one second here. When we do, we're enabled to apply the one another verses. Listen to these verses. I'm just going to just pluck a few out. Forgive one another. Yeah, amen. Be at peace with one another. You can't be at peace with someone unless you're reconciled with them. Equal concern for one another. No, we don't have equal concern for one another when they have done wrong and they deserve something bad. Devoted to one another. Try to be devoted to someone who's hurt you. Submit to one another. Yeah, that's really easy if you're not reconciled. Not lying to one another. Well, you know what? You come in this room you know that you've got something against someone, and they ask you, hey, how's it going? And you say, it's great. You just lied to them. Ouch. Encourage one another. Not something that we do unless we're reconciled. Admonish one another. Yeah, it's really hard. It's easy to challenge someone when you've already got something going on, and it doesn't work. Build one another up. Bear with or tolerate each other. Offer hospitality to one another. Love one another. Pray for one another. Not God, give him what he deserves. 
but really praying for one another. I can't obey 59 direct one another scriptures unless I'm reconciling. And of course, there goes my conscience. Because now I'm living in a place where I, sh I should not be. And it's being seared. I know the good I ought to do, but I don't do it. I'm in sin. That's sin for me. So I need to drop everything, do what Jesus calls me to do, and then go back and offer my gift. Amen? So, in closing, are we living with a seared conscience? Are we living with a seared conscience? Are we living with undealt with sin? We're about to cross those lines. It's eventually going to lead to our demise. We've got to confess it, get it out, deal with it, get sober, get clean, guys. We gotta Get clean, just get clean. It's one day at a time, right? If you go to any one of these recovery groups, one day at a time, one day at a time. Confession leads to mercy, forgiveness, and healing in sobriety. Got to get that stuff out. So I got to deal with my junk. But are we also allowing others around us to affect our conscience, right? Are we being watchmen and watchwomen blowing the trumpet, right? Calling it out, warning, letting people know, hey, this is what I see. Got to deal with other people's junk. And that's not going to be easy, right? We've got to use scripture to do that. And do I know of someone, someone who has something against me, hardening my heart, ignoring it and not facing it? I need to stop and reconcile, right? My junk might be other people's junk and end up becoming my junk. Point number three, right? Okay. I believe that if we can get this concept and live with a clear conscience, we will better connect with each other and better connect with God. We will be ready, really ready, confident and unashamed before God at his coming. Not perfect, okay, but healthy.